in my day-to-day -day life, sometimes my actions can show that I fear man more than I fear God. So sometimes my actions can show that I fear man more than I fear God. Now, of course, if you were to ask me, do I fear God more than I fear man? Of course, my answer would be that I fear God more than I fear man. But the issue comes in my day-to-day -day life sometimes. My actions show that sometimes I tend to fear man more than I fear God. Perhaps something happens and I know I should speak up, but I don't. Or I know I should do this certain thing, but I don't do it because I fear what others might think. Or I should um, speak this truth to someone, but I don't because maybe I fear what they're going to think of me or what others are going to think. And so my actions can show that sometimes I can tend to fear man more than I fear God. All of us, as Christ followers, as we're going to see in our passage for this morning, are called to fear God more than we fear man. That we should fear God more than we fear man. And so our passage for this morning, then, I hope you have your Bible so you can turn there with me, is from the Gospel of Matthew, and this is one of our revised common lectionary readings. It's from the Gospel of Matthew, and it's from chapter 10, and we're going to re read from verses 24 down to verse 39. Before I read that, I'll just set the scene for you. And so in chapter 10 of the Gospel of Matthew, we have Jesus' second major discourse. There's some major discourses in uh, the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus um, teaches for quite an extended period. And this is the second of those, the first being Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which occupies chapters 5 to, cha to the end of chapter 7. And so here we come to the second discourse, which is in chapter 10. And it has to do with missions. So here Jesus sends out the twelve, the twelve apostles. And the first part of this chapter speaks about the short-term mission, if you will, as one of my study Bibles puts it, to the people of Israel. So the twelve apostles' short-term mission to the peoples of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel, as Jesus puts it. And then as we come down to about verse 16 or so, Jesus begins talking about the more long-term mission, as my study Bible also puts it, the more long-term mission of Jesus' followers to the Gentiles and then to the ends of the earth, of course, as we learn as we continue reading the New Testament. And so this discourse has to do with missions. And as we get closer to verse 24, we're going to start reading. Jesus is telling them that they're going to face persecution. They're going to face hostility. They're going to be flogged in the synagogues. They will be brought before governors and kings. And these various things will happen. So Jesus is teaching them this. And then verse 24, he says this. The student is not above the teacher, nor is the servant above the master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to, to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, 
a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This is God's word to us. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands firm forever. What I want to focus on here is really verses 24 down to verse 31. Verses 24 down to verse 31. And from this, the, these verses of the many lessons we could draw out, I want to draw out at least four lessons. And the first two come in verses 24 and 25. So there Jesus says this, The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above the master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers. And there is our first point, that the disciples then, as well as Christ's disciples now, are called to be like the teacher. And for us, the teacher is Jesus. We are called to be like the teacher, like Jesus. When we seek to live out our life, we are to be like Christ. Christ followers are to be like Christ. And I think one of the great um, summaries, biblical summaries of what it is to be like Christ, if you will, is the fruit of the Spirit, that we are to display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We are to be like Christ, and we become like Christ as we pay attention to his words, which we find in the Bible, God's word to us, as we spur one another on in Christian community to grow and to be more and more like Christ, And as we keep in step with the Spirit, the very Spirit that God sent and the Spirit that now dwells in all Christ followers. So that's the first point. The first point, that disciples are to be like their teacher. We are to be like Christ. And as we read on, we'll see our second point. It is enough for students to be like their teachers, which I just said, and then he goes on, and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? How much more the members of his household? So Jesus here is saying, if they've ridiculed me, if they've literally, essentially called me Satan, Beelzebul, then how much more will they malign us? the followers of Jesus. And so that means for us, and this is our second point, that we are to expect persecution or to expect hostility. Now we, as uh, Canadians, people who live in Canada, we've not really faced this in the past. Our, our nation, our country, ha- has been for many years very much influenced by um, Christianity. And it's um, been one of the main religions in our nation. And so we've not really had to face much persecution or hostility. Now I need to remind you, though, that this is not the case for our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world who some daily face persecution. And furthermore, I would also add that things are rapidly changing in our own society. And we very much now, perhaps some do, face hostility or persecution. It might be more in subtle ways, but um, it's, it's beginning to be there as we hold to unpopular views views that we consider to be biblical views. But what I would say is that we as Christ followers, this ought to not surprise us. As Jesus himself said to his first disciples, and so God's word says to us, that we should expect persecution, that we should expect hostility. But to his disciples, Jesus goes on and gives us encouragement. He goes on to say, So do not be afraid. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. And here in verse 28 is where we come into contact with our third lesson. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, 
Be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Disciples of Jesus, and both early disciples as well as modern, are called to fear God more than man. And this comes back around to the point that I made in the introduction to this message, that we ought to fear God more than we fear man. Because what Jesus is saying here is that all that man can do to us, the worst that man can do to us, is to destroy the body, to take our life. But what God can do, we see here as well, that he can destroy both body and soul. He says, rather, be afraid of the one, that's God. In the NIV, it's capitalized. And so what's the point here is that it's God. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so we are to fear God more than man. And when we fear God more than man, that emboldens us to do what God has called us to do, even in the face of hostility. And here we see an important truth that we touched on earlier in this service when we looked at our theological truth, and that is the doctrine of hell. And as I said there, so I say here, that this is a teaching that we find in the Bible, and so we need to teach it. We need to teach all of God's word. As the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian elders about himself in Acts chapter 20, that he did not want to shrink back from declaring or proclaiming to them the whole counsel of God. And we should want that for ourselves as well. I know certainly as a pastor, that's what I want for myself. And so we need to teach this doctrine of hell, that for all those who are not united to Christ in faith, that they, will, they come under the just wrath of God and they will be eternally separated from God in hell, where they will be justly and grievously punished forever. A very sobering doctrine, but a biblical doctrine. And that's what I want to stress here, which is exactly why we need to teach it. And so this, when we understand this, we also see why the gospel is such good news. It's how we can escape from the just wrath of God. And the gospel is this, that God, the creator of the universe, who we are accountable to, sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for sinners like you and me. And that everyone who places their trust and faith in Jesus has life in his name. We are, we, um, that deals with the just wrath of God. We are spared, we escape the just wrath of God and our sins are done away with. This is the good news. And so I, and we get to spend eternity with God in heaven. And so I say to all of you watching this, if you've never placed your trust and faith in Jesus, I encourage you not to wait another second. Because everyone who places their trust and faith in Jesus has life in his name. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of how we escape the just wrath of God. And so that was our third point, that we are to fear God more than man. And then we read on, and we will see here our fourth and final point. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The fourth and final point is that we can trust our sovereign God. We can trust our sovereign God. What Jesus is doing here is he's comparing the disciples to sparrows. And in, in the, the day and age in which Jesus um, walked the earth, sparrows were sold for, we're told here, two sparrows for a penny. They were quite insignificant. And yet he says that not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And so if that's the case with, case with something as insignificant as a sparrow, how much more is it, is it of disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus Christ? And so because of that, we need not be afraid because we are worth more than many sparrows. And so we are called to trust our sovereign God, who is sovereign and in control of all things, 
things insignificant as well as things significant. Things that we would consider to be insignificant, things that we would consider to be significant. God is in control and sovereign over it all. And so we need to trust in him. And so those then are, are our four points. That disciples are to be like their teacher. We are to be like Christ. Number two, that we should expect persecution and hostility. Number three, that we are called to fear God more than we fear man. We are called to fear God. And number four, we are called to trust in our sovereign God. The God who loves us, our Father in heaven who loves us. We need to trust in him. And so as I draw this to a close, then I want to leave you with two final thoughts by way of conclusion. And the first is this, which has to do with our third point, how we are to fear God more than man. John Knox was a reformer who lived in the 16th century, that is the 1500s. And it was said of him that he did not fear man because he so feared the face of God. He did not fear any man because he so feared the face of God. And so I ask you, I ask myself, do we fear the face of God? Do we fear the face of God so that we do not then fear man? That we're not scared to speak truth because we know that God has called us to speak truth. That we're not afraid when we're in front of people to call out some wrong or some injustice. Because when we fear God, it emboldens us to do what God calls us to do, even in the face of the hostility and the difficulties that, that men, that people can throw our way. And so if we fear the face of God, we do not fear the face of man. And that's an important truth. And so I'd ask you to reflect on that. Do we fear the face of God? And the second final thought that I want to share with you comes from the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism, which picks up on our fourth point that I shared, that we can trust in a God who is sovereign. In the Heidelberg Catechism, the first question says this, what is your only comfort in life and death? And the answer is this, that I belong body and soul in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. And right here is the point I want, I want you to notice. That he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head, not a hair can fall from my head without it being the will of our heavenly Father. And the Catechism goes on to say, indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And so again, we see this point that we see also in chapter 10 of the Gospel of Matthew. It said there, Jesus said there, that not even a sparrow falls to the ground unless it's by the will of the Father. And here we see that not even a hair from our head will fall unless it's by the will of our Father who is in heaven. God is in control, and so we can trust him through the good times and the bad because we believe that nothing happens unless it's to bring God glory and for it to be the, for the good of all those who follow Christ. For God's glory and for our good. And so then, I encourage you to fear God more than you fear any man. And I encourage you to trust in your sovereign God, who is in control of all things. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise you and thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you that we can worship you on this Sunday morning. I pray, Father God, that as we look this morning at the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, that you'll help us to take these lessons to heart, that we are to be like our teacher, that we are to be like Christ, and that we should expect persecution and hostility, that when that comes our way, it should not take us by surprise, because 
Jesus warned us about it. That we should also fear God more than we fear any man. And lastly, that we can trust you, God, our Heavenly Father, through all things because you are in control. And nothing will happen to us unless it's by your will. And we know that those things that do happen to us are ultimately for your glory and for our good. So help us to trust you and help us to not be afraid. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.